behalf of my two colleagues who will you see is who you will see later um, it's a great pleasure to have you here and um, and we'll try to teach you a bit about explaining um, so just when I registered um, the guy asked me whether I was related to Thomas Müller um, and this is not the case not even Gerd Müller or Hansi Müller Okay, anyway, so um, basically you see the plan that we have, so there will be some um, extended introduction that I will give, then um, Gregoire will um, give his, his part of the talk, then we will refresh ourselves a bit, um, then Wojtek will come up with inter um, applications of interpretability, and I will wrap up things also quite extendedly. Okay, so um, I guess since you're here, you all have some idea why interpretability, why th this matters, or at least you want to try to find it out. Um, I will try, uh, try to give some very, very superficial um, answers to this, which we will, you know, get more detail, hear more details about. Um, so first of all, Um, the first question that is important is we would like to verify that our classifier works as we expect it to. And um, this has some obvious uh, applications in uh, self-driving cars but also in medical diagnosis. So it's clear that we would like a medical diagnosis system to do what it's doing what it's what what it's uh, what it knows how to do right so um, we would like to have a medical diagnosis system to really be um, as precise as a very experienced MD so um, the the second point is we would like to improve classifiers so um, in other words we would like to have um, a classifier not only um, you know be good in terms of our standard measures, namely prediction errors or generalization errors, but we also like to have that classifier um, do the right thing in terms of do something that um, resonates well with human experience when classifying. So think about the, the medical doctor diagnosing. So <clears throat> then finally, um, we would like to learn from the lear uh, from the learning machine. So, so we have uh, fed our learning machines with a lot of data, and they are able to do miraculous things like playing Go. It's a mirac miracle for me. Uh, I'm a very bad Go player, but I would like to, of course, learn more about what the learning machine that these Deep Mind people uh, trained, what, what, why they are doing things in the way. They're, they're doing it and what we can learn from it. And of course, um, having worked on neuroscience for quite a while, um, if we have some prediction models about brain function or um, brain states, maybe um, in some future, by interpretability, we can also learn about the human brain itself and its function. So, um, which brings me <coughs> to interpretability in the sciences. So um, nowadays, uh, machine learning becomes one of the main techniques uh, being used in the sciences, um, in biology, in chemistry, in physics, in um, bioinformatics, um, and medicine. And so you would like to, to see whether our great prediction models, whether they have actually understood anything about the problem that the data is about. and we would like to, so to say, use this knowledge that the um, models have and um, gain some insights, insights that we didn't have before, that are not in the database, so that are inferred. And we'll c see some examples of that. So this is a very interesting and, um, and novel kind of perspective. Um, finally, <clears throat> being European, um, the European Union has in May exercised a new law and this new law gives everyone um, the right to explanation. 
So which means that that um, if we are use if we are providing some services, there's no other option than to exp being able to explain it. And of course, this is a nightmare to many people, in particular the industry, but it's also uh, very good for the customer. Um, so, and um, currently people are thinking how to balance this appropriately. So, um, let me um, give you a bit of an overview <coughs> about the different techniques that are available. So, <coughs> sensitivity, deconvolution, and also our methods that are called layerwise relevance propagation, LRP, and friends. So, <coughs> first of all, if you if you think about, say, a neural network or any kind of kind of learning machine, then you can assume two different perspectives. One would be um, the mechanicians, so the one who has access to all the knobs and you know get gets all gets so to say the plane ready to fly and then there's the other one which is more the pilot's view which is the functional understanding view so the pilot doesn't really care so much about every little knob that is being turned unless is you it's use, uh, he's using it to fly or she so which means that basically you think about the neural network or the learning machine as a model to, to map something, and you would like to explain exactly that mapping and you would like to understand it in terms of the input. So we'll adopt this second point of view. And, um, and there's <clears throat> a number of different um, tasks that we can have. For example, this model analysis, which um, tries to to see what what our model um, um, is good for, what it does, um, and then there's the on average for the whole ensemble of data, and then there's the decision analysis, which boils down to the single decision. So it's more like the the MD's point of view. So it's taking so get, getting some data, and then has to diagnose, and that's an individual case. It's not the WHO perspective, which is this one here, um, where you see <clears throat> what on average across all the patients in all the planet uh, would be the typical things. So let me talk about this first approach. And um, there's some very nice methods that have been proposed. <clears throat> and um, it's about the class prototypes. You, you ask yourself, in the classification problem, which is multi-class, so what in this very high-dimensional non-linear um, learning machine? So, so what is the prototype? If we think about, you know, good old pattern recognition, then we think about prototypes. But now, of course, we have neural networks, so we we think about what is the appropriate class prototype for the whole ensemble, and then um, basically we have our function and we do some argmax of, of all axes um, for a certain class and regularize. And then we get these pictures, for example, by the work of Simon Jan, and of course more beautiful ones, but that was the first one. So you clearly see we would like to have prototypes for all the ensemble of data. So a very different approach is, is to get some understanding of individual um, data. And so, in other words, if you take this nice uh, picture, for example, of sheep and a human, and you would like to know why is a given image classified as a sheep, um, then you would like your model to answer. And um, so, certainly, the model thinks that blue speaks against sheep which is correct, I believe. And um, then red speaks for sheep, and you can see that the, the sheepish um, dimension is very well captured by the model that is, has been learned before. 
So that's basically um, this thing here, this colored uh, map is called the heat map. Um, and it's basically the output of our layer-wise relevance propagation algorithm. And you will learn a lot about it. So <clears throat> then there's also a, a third um, approach, which um, is called sensitivity analysis. And so the, the idea um, of our classifier would be, again, you have some input, which is the image, you have the neural net, and then you get, get some classification for whether or not this is a car. Um, and then you try to analyze this, this um, neural network or this learning machine in general by actually um, computing the partial derivative of, of the of overall function <clears throat> with respect to the xi's. So you're asking, you know, for every little pixel, what is the gradient? And that's called sensitivity analysis, and you're squaring it. So, <clears throat> interestingly, um, the line is missing. <laughs> it w it's not on my screen missing, but anyway. Um, so this is what you get out, right? So you see that ideally, you would like to have an answer that is located over, over the cars, but sensitivity analysis does not provide this to you. So it's not highlighting cars. So because sensitivity analysis explains the variation of the function and not the function itself, so sensitivity analysis basically tells you if you're wiggling a certain pixel xi, you know, will it become more or less a car? So I think that most people that use this method, which is a very good method if you ask exactly this question, um, they don't know about the, these inherent limitations. So there's another issue pointed out by some colleagues. Um, so if we are um, looking at gradients and sensitivity computes gradients, then um, if we are having a simple model which comes slightly out of fashion these days, rather we have some very deep layered models, then um, the, the function itself um, and the, the, the respective gradient computation becomes um, increasingly unreliable and high varying. High varying. So, so the information that is given to us by the gradient is essentially lost, which means that a method that only considers gradients is no good for this purpose. So, um, so the, the shattered gradients uh, was also, um, so, so also this paper here, um, you know, gives a very nice toy example where you, where you can actually clearly see that this, this gradient shattering is, a, is an issue. Okay, so, <clears throat> So our layer-wise relevant propagation that already analyzed the, the sheepish image um, doesn't have that issue. And the reason is that we are not computing, we are not computing gradient times input. So this is very important. Some people uh, still today, after having written a couple of papers, maybe more than a dozen, still think that LRP is gradient times input. No, it's not. Okay. So let's see what LRP does with such an image. And I hope that the resolution of the projector is good enough. So this is a scooter image. And, you know, nicely enough, the model, which is uh, AlexNet in this case, so we, are, we didn't even train it. We're just analyzing it. So just as a remark, we can analyze anybody's network that is available to us. So, <clears throat> so LRP provides um, the usual shapes that are, you know, important for, for scooters. Um, the, you know, the backlight and the tires and all these things. So you can see that makes some sense this side. And sensitivity actually has two issues that I already discussed. 
One is the gradient shattering, which makes the all, all pixels quite shattered across the space, so there's a lot of noise due to the gradient shattering. But moreover, there's some funny um, things that you find when you, when you just consider gradients. So this street here is getting a lot of attention by this sensitivity model. Why is that? Well, it's clear. <laughs> sensitivity asks which pixels should I change such that it becomes a scooter. Of course, if you change the road, then, you know, scooters are typically on roads. It makes some sense that these pixels are scooterish, you know, at least if you change them. But it's not the question that you may ask, which is, is this a scooter or not? Okay, so, which brings me again to um, discuss one more time, um, what are the general questions being asked? So the LRP, which is this one here, tries to decompose the function that we have from our neural network or learning machine and tries to answer the question, which pixels contribute how much to the classification? So the sheepish part, the scooterish part, whatever, right? Then saliency um, or sensitivity, um, by the way, <clears throat> just making a remark here, um, because I have all of you here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so gradients and sensitivity, this is not, uh, was not first invented by Simon Jan. It was, has been already available to researchers in neural networks in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And even we wrote a paper in 2010. So it's maybe they didn't all to the same extent understand the power and also the limits of sensitivity analysis. But <laughs> these things were there. Um, but it's, of course, a huge merit to make a lot of people understand what the possibilities and also what the limits are. So, therefore, you know, it's a very great work that Simon Jan was um, publishing these days. So, so, we are asking which pixels lead to increase or decrease of a prediction score when changed. So, the, think about the road pixels that are being changed and such that they be finally become scooters, okay? And then there's, of course, deconvolution and there's uh, the ex uh, activity maximization and the, all the methods that try to, to answer more the ensemble point of view. So, over all the data that we have from one class, what is the prototype in the light of our model, okay? So now, after I've mentioned um, LRP about one million times. Um, I will explain it in the first light way and then um, Gregoire and um, Wojtek will also give all the beautiful but tough math. But you can take it. So if you think about a neural network, and I, ha I don't have enough space on these slides to draw a deep network, but um, the forward pass of this neural network is basically you take your data, multiply it with weights, get, go through the, some nonlinearities, uh, have a threshold, and you do this for a while until you're done, the layered structure is deep enough, whatever. And then we get some um, classification errors for our classes. Um, in this case, um, the classifier was considering this ladybug because it's a ladybug um, and it's a good classifier. Um, it has been trained by the Google folks. Um, and now we are wondering, <clears throat> how can we go backwards? Now, um, the, ju just to, to make this very simple remark, um, if we have a linear learning machine, it's so easy to go backwards, right? Because you have this plane, 
and then you know if your data point is here, then basically, you know, that's the direction why it's there, right? Because it's perpendicular to the, to the hyperplane. But if you, um, say, you have an, a more adventurous classification line like this one here, then it makes a difference where you are, right? So if you're here, then it's this direction that makes it classified on this side. And if you're here, then it's this direction that is relevant. So going through nonlinearity is a challenge. And um, so therefore it has been unknown how to do this for a while. Um, and so um, Sebastian Bach, who now goes under the name of Lapushkin because he changed his name, um, he, he um, found out about this. So that's the LRP world. So assume that we are now having our classification. So we call these results of the classification, we call them relevances. So these are the function value that our network or our model provides. I'm saying our network or our model because all these other techniques that are somehow being forgotten <laughs> these days, like kernel machines, um, some that is very popular, LSTMs, uh, Gaussian processes, graphical models, for all of them you can actually formulate versions of LRP. So just to make this clear. So we initialize. Then the first thing, and this is now the naive uh, uh, propagation rule, um, and I, you will see the non-naive one um, later, but this is just to explain nicely. So we have now all our activities in the output, and you would like to uh, uh, compute the activity here, the relevance here. And so basically, we're taking what we have from the forward pass um, as, a, as a node activity here, that's the xi, and then we are summing up all the activities of the upper layer and normalizing it. Okay, so, so the, the nice thing is um, that you, in fact, let's, you know, put this, this is basically the same formula, except that here you may have made a change and it's consistent also with the formula that I showed before. So here you, sh you see that it's also, you also sum up activities, but you only take the positive part of what you get as a summation. So it's not really like the gradients only, but you actually do something to that, that actually uh, for which we can prove or can show um, that this is not subject to shattering and information loss and stuff. Okay, so the nice thing also about this method, I mean, you can also let, um, continue, right? Now you have all these activities here, then you compute the activities here and here and so on and so forth. This linear time algorithm. So, as opposed to many, many other contributions in the field, there's actually a very nice theory that says what we are actually doing. Um, and so there's proofs and that's quite nice. So, but, uh, so one, one very important ingredient in the whole process is that the relevance doesn't, the, the, there's no sink and no source of relevance. So all the summed up relevance in every layer is a constant and it's, it's a constant um, and, and it's, it's normalized to the function values. So I have been going through rather quickly through this first part in order to leave some more space and room to, to our um, later parts, but I would like to make these some more re historical remarks. I already said that people have been trying to explain neural networks for as long as they exist. So if you remember the the old PDP book, right? There were the Hinton diagrams. People called it the Hinton diagrams. This were, was like something like the, 
the uh, activities of neurons in every layer. So people try to use that to understand things. So, um, but more recently, there's um, um, the sensitivity things, but there's also a 95 paper on that. Again, there's some papers before that. And there's the Behrens paper that is from our side um, that actually was submitted for the first time in 2008, but people then didn't think that this was something important and impo uh, useful. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, the Bach paper, which was submitted 2014, and the uh, Deep Taylor decomposition paper, which was uh, submitted um, 2015. So a lot of the papers that are now existing, they can be seen as special cases of these, so to say, starting papers, and some of them actually make acknowledgement of that, and some of them don't. <laughs> but um, um, you know how things go. Um, there's LRP for LSTMs. Um, there's a, a, a very interesting line of research, um, starting with Lyme, where optimization is, is one of the, the key aspects. Then there's the whole um, deconvolution and guided uh, backprop um, procedures, um, and there's general um, uh, um, papers on, on trying to understand the model, and, and you, you can find, of course, I mean, these are snapshots, and you f can find, of course, many more um, papers um, and many more people who work in the field, and, and there's a good reason for it, because there's a need for explaining these very powerful models that we have, and generalization error is not enough for that. So I think uh, I, can, I can make a brief stop here, and um, if you would like to ask questions, uh, then of course you're always welcome, but um, you will need to use the microphone in order to do so. So can you, and anybody have a question for the moment? Yes, no? No questions? So everybody's still sleeping, it seems. Sorry? The other copy of slides will be available on our um, website. So, but, okay, so then I think this is Gregoire and Wojtek who will, who will continue. Um, and so first is, is Gregoire and, and I will sit down and relax a bit until they're done, okay? So, um, in the first uh, part of the tutorial, uh, Klaus gave um, an introduction to general interpretability techniques. And um, in this part, I will um, look more into the technical details. So, how do we implement it? How do we compare different methods? And one, one trend that um, has occurred is that, is that um, a large number of, of methods have been proposed. And if you look at this uh, list of methods, you see that a lot of them are 2016, 2017, and here I stopped at 2018 because there was no space on the slide. Um, but 
It seems that there is a lot of proposal and a need to compare these different methods. Which one do we choose? So one natural approach would be to say, well, maybe we have ground truth heat maps. So the idea would be that we have um, an, an input which is being classified by a DNN. Here it's a, it's a good one. It classifies it as a, it finds evidence for truck. Then it explains it. It produces a heat map. And then somehow we have to come up with some ground truth heat map and then compute the error. So what would be the ground truth? It would be some, some kind of highlighting of which pixels we believe the DNN has come up with for the class truck. Uh, and that might be feasible. But now, typically, a deep neural network will not only find evidence for one class, it might also find evidence for another class. And here you have, for example, some evidence for the class car. And then we are really uh, getting a hard time now at trying to find why the neural network predict this as a car. So, ground truths are difficult to um, obtain because we need to guess what the deep neural network does in the first place. So, in practice, um, people have, have recognized this problem and there is a need to go from comparing with ground truths to um, trying to define explanation axiomatically. And um, what is a what is this approach? Basically, you would like um, to test a method if it passes a number of uh, unit tests, and then, for example, retain the methods that passes all of them, or, or the most of them, or the most important ones. So here I will go through a few of these uh, um, properties of a heat map that are desirable. There has been many that have been proposed, but I will just go through four of them for uh, illustration purposes. And the first two are, are um, conservation and positivity. So what is conservation? Conservation, basically, it tells that uh, the attribution on the input features should be in proportion to the amount of evidence at the output. Of course, uh, to the amount of explainable evidence, right? If the neural network predicts always the same thing but does not look at the image, then there is no explainable evidence. So that's something which, which sounds reasonable, which means that if it doesn't find something, for example, it doesn't find uh, a, a frog here. Um, it will just have to produce a heat map which is zero. But also to make sure that this heat map with no evidence is zero and not minus 10 and plus 10, for example, we also need to enforce something called a positivity, where if the neural network is certain of his prediction, input features are either relevant or irrelevant. Contradict contradictions, so negative scores might um, be due to, for example, the neural network being uncertain about its, um, its prediction. So those are two um, rather technical properties. Uh, and um, in, indeed, uh, all this explanation can be somewhat normalized to reach them. But now let's look at some that are more difficult to reach. And one of them is continuity. And here the idea is that if two inputs are almost the same, for example, two trucks but with a slight perturbation, and the prediction is also almost the same, basically they model evidence for truck with the same amount, then the explanation should also be almost the same. And here we see a simple example um, where we have 2D function, which is the maximum between two variables, given as a contour plot. And here the explanation, so the importance of x1 and x2, is given as a vector field. And here we see that method one, which is basically based on the gradient, has a discontinuity at x1 is equal to x2, which means that two very similar inputs will be um, explained in different way, although they are actually almost the same and predicted the same. So what we would like to do instead is to have a method which gradually uh, reorients the explanation from x1 to x2 as you move in the input domain. And in practice, you, you want to test it um, on real data. And this is an example where here um, I, I look at two methods, LRP with a special propagation rule, basically the default one, uh, versus sensitivity analysis. And um, what I do here, I follow some paths in the input domain. And um, as you can see, 
um, the explanation is changing, right? So it finds, uh, it adapts to the features it see in the data to explain evidence for the class truck here. And what we plot on the right is in black the function, so the evidence for the class, and in red uh, the relevant score for some pixel at the center, which we, just, which we rescale for um, um, visualization purposes. And what you observe is that one method is actually producing a continuous pass in the input domain, which, which reflects the fact that the prediction is actually continuous. And on the other hand, you see that um, methods that are based on the gradient, for example, sensitivity and analysis, they tend to produce a discontinuous explanation. And a result is that if you look at the heat map, it tends to, to flicker at much higher frequency than the image is actually changing. Now there is one more property, and this is the last I will, I will talk about, it's selectivity. And here, it is perhaps the practica practically the most important one. Model must agree with the explanation. In some sense, if one feature is considered relevant, then if you remove it, then the prediction score should decrease. And um, here again, you have a small example with the same function. And method one always assigns relevance to the first variable, but it's clear that when x2 is larger than x1, removing x1 will not change the output. So this uh, method one is not um, uh, having selectivity, while the method two, which will produce this uh, reorientation of relevant score in the input domain, will have uh, selectivity. So this again can be tested on real data, and uh, here I refer to an algorithm that was uh, developed by ourselves in 2015 and then 2017 uh, in the context of images. It's uh, pixel flipping. And here the idea to test selectivity is that we will take our heat map and um, start destroying the image where relevance is the highest. And that what you would like to do then is to check how fast the function f of x decreases. And the fastest it decreases, the better it is, so the more selective the heat map is. So here I introduced four different um, properties, and now what you can do, so basically the idea of this axiomatic approach is to have a list of methods to compare, and here I just show six of them, but there are many more we can integrate in this table, and uh, a list of properties, and here again there are four axioms, but we might actually consider more of them as well. So here we see that, uh, for example, uh, LRP uh, with this uh, propagation rule, alpha 1, beta 0, that I will introduce in more details later, uh, works well. And um, now one more question is that here, to basically fill this table, we had to uh, do experiments. It's nice because it produces things that are data specific, and usually it's easy to come up with an experiment, but sometimes we would like to understand uh, this property directly from the equation. And uh, the question is, can we actually deduce these properties? Um, and um, for this, I will just uh, go through a quick recap of two methods. And then um, once um, this recap is done, we will look at the different properties, um, at, um, at how to deduce these uh, axioms. So first, uh, backpropagation. So backpropagation, basically, you have a forward pass, which is the activation uh, weighted combination of um, input activations plus some bias, then you uh, apply some nonlinearity. here it's the max function, and then what we can do, we can compute the gradient via uh, error backpropagation, here it's the chain rule, and um, you see basically this on the top right equation, and then um, the other method we will look at is LRP with the rule alpha 1 beta 0, which is the default one. And um, here, basically, the activation, so the forward pass is the same, except that to redistribute the signal from the output down to the pixels, we will, look some, we will use something different. So let's look at uh, conservation. Uh, and what we would like, we would like to, s what we will, the approach we will follow is that we will try to look whether conservation takes place at one layer. And if it is true, does it also occur in the lower layer? And this is easy to, to show. Basically, we have to add a sum 
on both sides of the equation, and then you see that the two sums on the right-hand side permute, and then you have a fraction of the same quantity, and this cancel out, and we have directly the sum of relevance at layer i is equal to the sum of relevance at layer j. And then we can apply this uh, reasoning inductively to go from f of x, so the output, down to the input layer. So without doing any experiment, we have already deduced conservation. So now there is another method which is based on gradient. It's called gradient times input, which is not LRP, it's something, something different. And uh, here we can actually show that um, it does not, in the general case, ensure conservation. So how we do? Uh, we cannot say directly from the original formula, but we can compute a weighted sum on both sides and then um, reorder the uh, summations and then we get more or less the same as we have for LRP except that there is a difference. First, the uh, W are not uh, rectified and there is also a, a bias in the denominator. What that means is that when the bias is negative, the scores will tend to inflate over time. Now, there is one more property I will uh, look at, try to deduce from, um, um, for, um, uh, between uh, LRP and gradient times input. The first one, um, okay, let's first look at gradient times input, and here we have this chain rule that we presented before, and here we have this term highlighted in blue. One zj is larger than zero, and this is an indicator function, it's discontinuous, meaning that if you change your uh, um, data point in your input domain, then the Z, ZJ, which is the pre-activation of a given neuron, will suddenly pass us the threshold where uh, the gradient switches or uh, go through a discontinuity. Now, it's hard to see, um, to analyze this continuity for LRP directly from the formula, but what we can do, we can rewrite it in a way, in the same way that the gradient uh, is, um, is written. And um, this is what you have on the third line. And what you see is basically it's the same, except for the blue term, which is not anymore an indicator function, but a ratio of two quantities. And in fact, we can show that if the bias is negative, then the denominator always upper bounds the numerator. And uh, this brings uh, continuity. So again, you can use this inductive argument um, to first observe that the um, C at the output is one, and then backpropagate and uh, find out eventually that the heat map will be continuous. So again, with no ex ex experiments. So that closes the, the first part of the technical um, session. Uh, and uh, let's just recap, recapitulate the points we have been making. First, that ground truth explanations are elusive and it's better to rely uh, on um, testing the heat maps for some axioms, whether they are, um, for example, conservation, positivity, continuity, but also selectivity, which we can test with pixel flipping, for example. Second, um, some of these properties don't need uh, an experiment to test them. They can be deduced directly by looking at the equation, or sometimes you can also show that uh, some of these methods do not satisfy them uh, also from the, from the same equations. And what is also interesting sometimes is that you see, ah, okay, um, basically, um, if the bias would be zero, that would become continuous, right? So you can look at this analysis to then uh, try to improve the method uh, you are working it or with or basically try to refine its domain of applicability. And uh, finally, the third point is that we've shown that um, this uh, basic uh, LRP rule satisfies some key properties of an explanation, which uh, um, gradient-based methods uh, do not have. So now I um, go to the second part of this talk, which is uh, really um, what we have been, um, what I've been focusing for the past few years is basically to try to understand uh, these methods uh, as a deep tailor decomposition. And deep tailor decomposition is a framework which I will introduce and um, it will be used then to be able to um, 
uh, derive a new propagation rule that are specific to certain input domain or certain types of layers. So, deep Taylor decomposition, um, as his, its name says, will try to compute Taylor decomposition, but in a deep manner, so basically at every layer. And uh, deep Taylor decomposition makes one key assumption, is that the relevance which is being propagated from the top layer to the input layer has a product structure which is basically the product of the activation of the same neuron times something approximately constant, and which will actually be treated as constant in our equations. Um, what is the advantage of this property is that then we can actually see relevance as a function of the, of the previous layer. So what we will do now, we will look at this uh, relevance as a neuron where we have the input activations, then some weights, and then RJ. And RJ basically is a ReLU neuron just with different um, weights uh, that incorporates the context, right? So this um, C term, which is the modulation terms that comes from the top, gets injected into the maximum in, in the max function. And now we have like this function, which we'll try to analyze using Taylor decomposition. And Taylor decomposition will basically give us what is the weight the proper way to redistribute from one layer or from one neuron to the neuron of the previous layer. So this is how it works. So here on the left, this is uh, the relevance neuron. And uh, on the right, you have a diagram of relevance uh, uh, viewed from the top. So the function here, the ReLU function, is shown as a contour plot. And what we will do, we will do Taylor expansion. So we will place ourselves uh, um, close to the hinge of the ReLU function, but not so close as to reach zero exactly, just at the limit. You know? So this is A tilde. What we do now, we do this uh, Taylor expansion. So Taylor expansion is a mathematical tool. You can write it down. This is with written at the bottom. So the relevance as a function of the activation in the previous layer can be seen as first the, re the re re relevance um, evaluated at the reference point, then plus uh, a sum of all the first order Taylor expansion terms, uh, and then plus an epsilon, which is everything which is um, um, second order, third order, or higher order. Because it's a um, linear function, or at least it's a linear on the domain we are looking at, the epsilon is zero. And also because we take the reference point right next to the hinge of the ReLU function, the, the score, the relevant score at this position is also zero. So now what we are left with is this um, term in the middle. And uh, what is nice is it's a sum over all the input features, which means that it gives us essentially um, uh, identification of what are the uh, importance of each input neurons for producing relevance in the higher layer. And this term in the middle can be rewritten in closed form. Uh, we can see it below. And um, this will basically give us the relevance message. So we have the our relevance at a neuron, and then we will redistribute it to the previous layer according to this equation. So we will call it the generic deep Taylor rule. Um, and this is a deep Taylor rule that then, if we choose the reference point uh, ap appropriately, um, will give us a different rule that are specific to, for example, ReLU layers, uh, that are specific to pixel layers, and so on. So now how to choose the root point? So there are many different ways to do so. Um, one could do, for example, nearest root search. So we start at the activation A, and then we go along the direction of gradient of your relevance neuron until we hit the root point. What we can do also, we can um, take our, um, our um, activation and then rescale it towards the origin. Um, and typically, if we constrain biases to not be positive, then we will also hit a root point. And then finally, there is one last 
um, approach, number three, which will be, which will be uh, retain its rescaled ex excitation, and basically we will uh, follow approach two, but add a small modification to it, we will descend um, in the input domain only along directions that have positive weight. Yeah, so we can call it rescaled uh, excitations and not inhibitions. And if we choose number three, then we get this uh, generic uh, or this uh, default LRP rule that uh, we've shown to work well and to satisfy some interesting axioms. And um, now, what is actually the point of having uh, come up with this uh, construction in the first place? Um, well, now we can actually start to look at uh, this root point and what it means in practice. And here we have a checkbox, um, a, a, a checklist of different properties of the root point. The first one, the first column, is whether the root point belongs to the input domain. And the second one is whether the root point is close to the actual uh, activation pattern. Nearest root, because it's the nearest root, right, it is indeed close from the activation pattern. Rescale activation. Um, is not close to the pattern because it might descend along inhibition directions and it might actually uh, make the travel longer. Nearest root, on the other hand, uh, might uh, step out of the input domain. So here, if we consider ReLU layers, the input domain is the space of positive activations and uh, there might be direction where the gradient is high but where the activation is low, which means that suddenly, if you descend, you will step out of the input domain. Um, so this risk scale activation actually satisfies both. So it is at the same time staying in the input domain, but also reasonably close from the activation pattern. So that gives some further motivation for this rule from the perspective of um, uh, Taylor expansions. But wait a minute, we've made some assumption at the beginning that um, uh, the relevance has some product structure. And the question is, was it true? So here we'll say, okay, we retain this uh, uh, alpha beta rule and uh, we'll um, use an inductive argument. We will assume that it was true in the higher layer. So it's near, here it's not J, it's K, right? And um, we will apply relevance propagation in the lower layer and then try to rewrite relevance as uh, activation times C. And now we have to analyze this uh, variable C uh, that you see just below the underbrace. And uh, this actually, there is a good um, argument to say it's approximately constant because if you look at the structure CK, so the, right, the term on the right side is indeed constant. This is our initial assumption. W is a parameter, so it's also constant. And then you have this ratio of uh, um, sums, um, which contains actually AJ, but actually the dependence of CJ on the activation of the same neuron is diluted uh, among the dependence on many other neurons in the same layer. And then you have a further dilution uh, in the outer sum uh, over all the higher layer neurons. So the dependence between CJ and the, the neuron activation exists, so it's not exactly constant, but it exists among um, perhaps hundreds or thousands of other um, variables depending on which it depends. So this uh, argument um, gives us um, some, some reason to think that um, CJ will indeed be approximately constant. So let's uh, zoom out and see where we are now. So we've shown that this uh, rule can be seen as a deep Taylor decomposition. And then this deep Taylor decomposition now will show that we can play with the root points or play with the structure of the layers to uh, produce new domain uh, and layer specific rules. And those are um, some um, different layers, typically pixel layers or uh, embedding layers, for example, war 2 vec 
And here you don't have this domain constraint that the input variables are positive. Uh, they have other constraints. For example, pixel, la la um, pixel layers, uh, the input domain is subject to box constraints, right? But pixels have to be between uh, um, black and white uh, along each um, color component. So what we can do, we can choose um, dedicated root point. And here, basically, how we will choose it? We will choose it in the corner of the color cube opposite to the um, neuron um, weight. So which means that if we have a detector for blue, we will say, OK, we will try to take our data point and making, look, making it look like uh, orange or yellow. And if we inject this propagation rule in the generic deep Taylor decomposition rule, then we get something else that we call the box rule or the, uh, the beta rule, depending on the, on the paper. Um, then you have also the embedding layers that are basically presumably unconstrained. And here, uh, if we remind that we would like actually to stay in the input domain, well, th this, is not a, this is not a constraint anymore. Uh, the only constraint that kicks in is that we would like to take a root point which is close to the actual data point. And what we'll do, we'll use the nearest root strategy. So we'll just say that the uh, difference between the, the point and the root point should be a multiple of the weight. And then we get another rule, which we call the W square rule. So now you have um, um, other types of layers, for example, pooling layers. And here there's also some insight that actually you don't need to define a special rule for these pooling layers. You can simply observe that the pooling layer is the same as a ReLU layer with weight 1. So it is the same on the condition that the inputs are actually positive values. So we can just treat some pooling as a, a standard ReLU detection layer, no need to re-implement, or no need to derive a new propagation rule. Then you have the p-norm pooling layer, which is um, um, one example of which is the max pooling layer in the case where p is equal to infinity. Uh, and here, what we do is that we actually rewrite uh, the activation or the output of this layer as a sum pooling times a ratio of norms and treat this second term as constant. And then we also use some argument for constancy. For example, the ratio of norms is indeed a uh, constant under, for example, the rescaling of the, of the activation or a permutation of the input variables. So that's our uh, recommendation, is that if you have pooling layers, just treat them as uh, ReLU detection layers. So zooming out, this is the general recommendation for CNN. So we have uh, a typical CNN here. The first thing we need to do at analysis time is to add uh, a small ReLU layer at the end, uh, because Deep Taylor always assumes that you have a ReLU at the end. What it also says, basically, is that we can only explain what is being detected in the image. Mm. And then we go backward in the graph, and basically, whether it's pooling or convolution, we just use LRP alpha beta, because it's the rule which is um, appropriate for um, layers with positive ReLU activation as input except for the first layer where you use the special deep Taylor decomposition rule for pixels. So now, if you do that on networks that have not been very well trained, then sometimes um, the selectivity tend to suffer. What we can do is to, uh, for the very top layer or the uh, few top layers, you can replace this alpha one beta rule by something which is more selective. And that's what we do in practice in our applications. Um, now, deep Taylor decomposition is not only restricted to um, deep neural networks. Actually, it's a general uh, framework to derive explanation for any um, classifiers. Of course, we need to find this, uh, uh, this decomposition in the first place. But um, here is some recent work where we've um, considered a kernel one class SVM. And here the insight is that we can actually rewrite uh, this kernel one class SVM as a two-layer neural network. 
composed of layers that are actually uh, decomposable using deep Taylor decomposition. Basically, you have first a mapping to the distances and then a soft mean pooling, which is kernel dependent. And these are the rules that you, uh, the propagation rule that you get. And if you do that, then you get your decomposition of outlierness on uh, the input variables. So this is recent work that we um, uh, is on archive uh, since uh, last month. Now there is one last aspect that I will touch on is how to implement this propagation rule efficiently. Because either we can uh, run for loops in all the sums, but typically when we want to explain something like AlexNet or GoogleNet, it will take a lot of time. So first, what we can observe is that this uh, propagation rule can be broken down in four different steps. First, you compute uh, some weighted activation, summed up, then you take the relevance and then you use this weighted activation to normalize, you produce some quantity S, then you run a backward pass and you get some C, I, and then uh, you multiply by the activation, right? And all this um, um, equation can actually be written in vector form and you will have like a sequence of matrix multiplication and element-wise uh, multiplications or divisions. And in practice, you don't even need to do this maximum multiplication because most of the time in modern uh, neural network libraries, those are already implemented by the forward and backward pass of neural networks. So what we can do, uh, there is a trick for this uh, layer. You can basically clone your, your layer, set the weight to, to W, set the bias to zero, and then you apply this, you, you invoke uh, forward on the, on the clone, then uh, divide, then invoke again backward on the clone, and then multiply. And this basically will run um, as quickly as the forward and backward pass that you use for prediction and training. So how LRP scales? As a result of this uh, implementation, efficient implementation actually scales in linear time. So it won't be more than five to 10 times slower than the forward time, the forward pass, which means that uh, first um, it can be um, used to explain a few images um, of big network even on the CPU or on uh, low power systems. But also um, this linear time scaling allows if you have um, big network and also GPUs, for example, to to use uh, LRP, for example, for uh, real-time uh, video processing or uh, as part of training. So let's just recap what we've uh, discussed in this talk. Uh, so first, the first part of the talk has been looking at how to select uh, a good model. And um, it's, we cannot do it based on ground truths uh, because we don't know the ground truths and it's actually, it's more practical to rely on axioms. Then some of the properties that I've mentioned can be deduced from the structure of the explanation method uh, by looking at the equations and order can be tested empirically. And here, the um, disadvantage of empirical testing is that your, your property will be tested only in a very specific setting, but on the other hand, if your, the formal definition of your property, for example, selectivity does not exist, then uh, you can really, um, you can still be able to, um, to test this, uh, this, this property in the context you are using it. Um, finally, so we've looked at this uh, LRP default rule which satisfies key property of an explanation and uh, we've, sh we, 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 we've, we've, we've seen um, that compared to sensitivity analysis, for example, it uh, uh, satisfies more, more axioms. Sensitivity analysis um, breaks some key axioms, for example, continuity or um, conservation. And then this propagation rule can be seen actually as a deep de Taylor decomposition in the context of deep relu net. So it gives kind of an underlying theoretical framework to think about the problem of explanation. And finally, we can use this deep Taylor decomposition framework to um, improve the explanation or to improve the explanation technique by extending it to new models 
and to new types of data. Okay, so now if you have some questions. Yes, there is a microphone. So, I was intrigued by your um, talking about continuity as a criterion. Mm -hmm. I mean, continuity, I would think continuity would be broken if we had very spiky probability distributions around these classes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are saying that if the input changes slightly, the output should be almost the same. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking that if your PDFs are very, very spiky, mm -hmm. then in fact, when it changes slightly in a certain region, the output will change very abruptly. So you, so this will work nicely when you have long tails, but for spiky distribution, mm -hmm. at least in those regions, yeah. it may not work. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. I think there are, there are two points that we can make. First, uh, we have to differentiate between actually the uh, classification decision, which indeed is spiky because uh, typically as we move suddenly, we will change our decision from one class to the other. Here in this uh, framework, we don't actually model the decision directly, but rather the evidence for a certain class. So this will typically move more smoothly. So it's like, think of like modeling probabilities or, or log probabilities. I see you're saying you're modeling the score rather than the decision as it were. Yes. Okay. And okay. then also, uh, it's true, there are some models that might actually be uh, discontinuous, right? Maybe those that are based on the threshold function in the, in the uh, different layers. Um, so in that case, continuity is not something that we would like to enforce. We only want to enforce continuity in, in the context of uh, neural networks, for example, with a continuous function, for example, rel ReLU uh, neurons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are still a bit of ahead of time, so I will give the first first uh, part of my talk uh, before the coffee break, because coffee will be available from 10. Um, yes, yeah, so I, again, like a quick recap, um, so what, where are we? We, are, we were talking about explaining uh, deep neural networks or other black box uh, MM models and the idea was to decompose the decision and to, uh, to assign relevance scores to every input dimension, for example, to every uh, pixel, so that uh, each pixel contributes, gets a relevance uh, which equals its contribution to the prediction. And we saw the simple LRP rule, which, which tells you if a pic, if, which depends on two factors, like the activation. So a, pic, a, a neuron which is more activated is more important for this particular uh, sample, so should be more, uh, should get more relevance. And uh, also the weights, so the, the connections of the network. And we saw that there was also like an extension, the alpha beta rule, which Gregoire was referring to, which has two parameters, alpha and beta. And for specific uh, choice of these parameters, if you set alpha to uh, one and beta to zero, uh, you will arrive at the steep tailored uh, decomposition interpretation. And uh, also, like the excitation backdrop paper, which was to propose 2016, is in this sense also like a special case of, of this propagation rule uh, with alpha equals one. So there are basically these, these two, these two uh, rules which were proposed uh, for LRP. Yeah, so I mean, they have, so I'm, my talk is about application, so this is just a brief overview where we applied uh, LRP in, in recent years. So we applied it not only to images. Of course, we, in, we always show uh, examples on images because it's very uh, appealing and it's easy to understand, uh, to interpret also for us humans, uh, to make sense of the, of the relevances, but we also applied it to other types of data. For instance, for text, 
we applied that to recurrent neural networks to, ident to classify text documents or to uh, perform sensitivity analysis. There we get relevances like on a word basis. So every, we, we can see like how much, how important is a particular word to the prediction. Um, yeah, we applied it to, uh, to this Atari games from DeepMind. I will show you some videos later after the break. Um, we applied it to visual question answering very recently on the clever data set where we have a question uh, to some image and we, can, we are able to compute these relevances and make sense of the model uh, for, the, for the text part so we can see like which words in the questions were important for, for this question, for understanding the question and also on the image part we can see which, uh, where the model was looking at to answer this question. So this is different from attention models, which people usually also use in this VQA uh, uh, for, to answer to do this VQA task. Here we, we we have a model and we we provide these explanations, as as uh, Gregoire and Klaus uh, uh, told you. We applied it recently to videos, got some new insights uh, there, and to. Um, to some morphing attacks on images where you have fake images, fake uh, faces and real faces. We applied it to some gate pattern analysis with some sports uh, data sets to, to, to faces, to histopathology, to the sciences, to fMRI. We have a recent, uh, recent paper on that, to EEG and so on. And, and also to speed. So we, we applied these techniques to different models and also got different insights about, uh, about, about the model itself or about the data or about the, the, the training configuration. So, so in my talk, I will, I will mainly talk about this. What did we really uh, get from, from this analysis? What did we learn uh, on these different problems? So we will not cover all of them, but, but I, will, I will cover some, some, of, some of them. And as Gregoire also told you, uh, LRP framework is applicable to different types of models. So we not only convolution neural networks, but also recently it has been extended to LSTMs. We can also interpret uh, local renormalization layers uh, in this deep Taylor framework. We have applied it to back of words models, to Fisher vector classifiers, as more classic, classical computer vision uh, models, which have been around for, for some time and also to one class SVM. So I will also briefly, briefly mention that. So the key question when, when seeing like all these applications, all, all this uh, theory which, which Gregoire uh, presented is, is now what? So what, what shall we do? What, what's, first of all, like the first question which comes into mind is uh, can, how, good is, how good are the explanations which we get? Can we somehow evaluate it? Can we compare it to some other? other methods and also uh, what can we do with it? So how can we use it in practice? How can we really get insights uh, in, into these deep models? And I will, I will, before the break, I will brief, briefly talk about the first part, about uh, how to evaluate explanations, how to compare. I will present some results from our analysis. And after the break, I will, I will talk about uh, uh, how, how to apply it in practice and what what uh, insights do we gain uh, on, on different uh, data, tests, data sets and different tasks? So, um, yeah, so Gregoire uh, introduces selectivity uh, uh, measure, which we, which we like initially thought of when we, when we ask ourselves how to compare different uh, explanation methods. So, assume you have like this three three explanations of the prediction bird according to sensitivity, the convolution of LRP. And you could, and the question is now how to objectively measure or what is a good measure of telling like which one is, is, bet, is best. One can look at these maps and subjectively tell that, but we wanted to know, uh, we wanted, we proposed like one, one measure, one measure uh, for that. And it's, it's based on selectivity. So the assumption is that we, if our, our heat map like really identifies the important part in the, in the image, then destroying this part or destroying the information at this part, flipping these pixels or, or, or randomly, uh, randomly destroying them should uh, lead to a decrease of the classification function. 
if you if your heat map is random, if it's non-informative, then the uh, if you destroy like this information like randomly, then the decrease should be much slower. So just by measuring this, how fast the function decreases, you get an idea of how how good this heat map uh, is. It's just as as mentioned earlier, this is just like one one measure of uh, of heat map quality. But uh, we, we did some experiments with that, and I will I would like to present it to you uh, now. And important, maybe we remove information in a non-specific manner. So we just sample from a random distribution or flip these pixels. We are not introducing like very specific uh, bias when when destroying the image at this this place. So here you see like for MNIST, you see like digits, heat maps, and we have a prediction uh, score. And we see if we more and more destroy these images, we see that like the prediction score goes down and we can measure, for example, the area over this curve and take this as measure of quality, of heat map quality. And the faster your, 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 your curve, your scores decrease, uh, the larger the, 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 uh, the this area will be so larger values are, are good. We can do it like also with sensitivity analysis. We get also some some area uh, for that, and also by destroying randomly uh, these pixels, and we see that the, the the score is much the area is much smaller. So we did this experiments, and and here we see that when according to this area measure. Uh, LRP like is, is, is better the sensitivity analysis and random uh, heat maps, and but of course it's all it's only MNIST, so you can ask yourself what about more complex data sets? How does it perform like on more more relevant uh, data? And we also did experiments on on on, on more uh, complex data like the Sun data set, the uh, ImageNet uh, data, and also MIT places. So we took uh, yeah we, we compared like three approaches for that. It, we started this paper, I think, already 2015. So uh, at that time, this were like the, the major approaches for explaining uh, neural networks. And uh, we computed heat maps using Simonian's method. We computed heat maps using Zeil and Fergus methods. And we computed heat maps using LRP. Uh, and then uh, yeah, evaluated this using, uh, using this area measure. And what you see here is like, uh, this area, so larger values are better. So you see that the, the, this pixel, the area over this pixel clipping curve is, is in all cases on all three data sets uh, largest for, for LRP compared to the convolution and also sensitivity analysis. And this is in line with what uh, Gregor and, and Klaus uh, presented before because sensitivity heat maps have, are noisy because of this gradient shattering. So they have uh, this, they are not so selective as, as LRP, and uh, also they, the convolution sensitivity asks a different questions, so it solves a different problem. So um, um, yeah, this is like consistent with with the re results with the um, analysis which you see, saw before. So I will always have like in the right uh, co upper corner this yellow uh, boxes where there are some more details on what we really did. And I will not mention it, but you can you can read it and and you see you get a better feeling like what these uh, curves uh, show. So this is for the image experiment. So you see in the image case, like LRP outperforms the other methods. We also did this for 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 text. So here you see a. Uh, so we trained a neural network on uh, the 20 news groups data on text classification, document classification uh, task. And uh, computed like heat maps using uh, also like sensitivity analysis and, and LRP. And here you see that some relevant words. So this text is classified as category medicine. And you see that the relevant words which have been identified are body, discomfort, sickness, uh, which kind of makes sense for, for us intuitively that they are related to, to med medical topic. And uh, but we want to evaluate and compare like these different heat mapping methods using this uh, pixel flipping or word deleting techniques. So we did this. We did this uh, also here. And the left the left curve shows uh, the example. So if you randomly 
delete words. So by deleting, I mean we set this, so every word is represented by a word to vec vector, and by deleting, I mean that we set this vector to zero. And uh, if you s randomly set like words to zero, uh, then you, the decrease of the score of the accuracy is, is only minimal. If you do it according to sensitivity analysis, uh, you, you get a much higher uh, decrease. And if you, if you do it with LRP, uh, the decrease is even higher. Uh, it's interesting that for the first two words, uh, the first two words, uh, sensitivity analysis and LRP, uh, there is almost no difference. So it seems that sensitivity analysis and LRP identify the first two words as, as important. So they are like this keywords of a text like uh, like discomfort, for example, uh, can are identified by both methods equally. But later, later, you, if, if the far the further you move, you see a difference between these two. And uh, uh, the nice thing about this uh, uh, epsilon LRP rule, which was maybe not mentioned in detail uh, before, is that LRP gives you signed explanations. So you see, not only I mean I, I can show it to you here. You see not only what speaks uh, for, so if, if you look at the MNIST example three, so the first heat map shows you the heat map for a three. It tells you what uh, what makes the three a three, what what speaks for the prediction three, and you see that there is there is a gap on the left of the, of the three, which is very important for the classifier to identify this number as a three. Which makes sense because if, if if there wouldn't be a gap, if there would be a stroke, a line, then this would not be a three, but an eight or a nine. So this classifier learns that if if it's a three, there is some 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 gap. But we can also explain not only with respect to the real class or to the classified class, but we can also explain with respect to some other class. For example, we can ask a, the question, what makes this digit a nine? Although it has not been classified as a nine by the classifier, but we can redistribute all the evidence which speak for or against the nine in this case. And we see this blue, blue, uh, blue heat, heat map, like the, the right uh, heat map for the three, we see that there is a blue part which tells you there is something missing, there is some information which, at this location which speaks against classification nine. This is not a nine because there is something missing there. And uh, so we get signed explanations. We get inf information like what, what supports uh, uh, the classification and also like what speaks against in, in, this, in the case of, of uh, epsilon uh, uh, LRP. And we can, we, what we did also in text, so we use the sign explanation. So we also have uh, like words which speak against uh, the classification medicine. And we have words which speak for the classification medicine. And, and we, we see in, in the plot, in the right plot here, that uh, here we, we deleted not the, the most relevant words, but the least relevant words, which means the, the words with the highest negative scores. So, but we did this for the falsely classified documents. And we, we, we see that if you like make, if you get rid of this, uh, of this words which speak against the true class, uh, the uh, accuracy largely increases for the LRP uh, method. The, for sensitivity analysis, there is no sign. So the, the, the sign of the gradient uh, is, cannot be interpreted in this way. So th therefore you see that for sensitivity analysis, there is no, no increase, um, which is also like two sides of two different types of evaluation. So you can either delete the relevant words for the correctly classified documents, or you can delete the least relevant words or the words with the most negative evidence for the falsely classified documents. And, and so you, you, you see like this, these two types of evaluations here. Um, yeah, so maybe the, the last slide which I have uh, for that, for this evaluation part, this is our, our recent paper, 2018, uh, where we com compared, where we did this analysis also for LSTM, uh, for LSTMs. So the idea was to compare methods which have been proposed, proposed to explain predictions of LSTMs. So this, this t the task here is uh, sentiment analysis on the Stanford sentiment tree bank data set. So we took uh, the bidirectional LSTM model from Lee et al. 
So we didn't, I mean, we retrained it, but, but we, we, we didn't propose a new, new model. We, we took what was proposed in the literature. And we also computed this word deleting experiments here. And we compared this, uh, like different methods, we compared just the gradient, so the sensitivity analysis. We compared gradient times input. We compared uh, like uh, LRP by Aras et al. So this is like the, the method which we suggest proposed uh, in 2017. We compared uh, another LRP variant which was proposed by Dink et al. And also in 2017. And uh, we compared about a very recent approach of Murdoch which he presented at ICLR this year. So in his work, he didn't compare uh, against uh, our LRP technique, so we, we compared uh, against him. And you, you all see in this experiment that um, like LRP and, uh, uh, and CD uh, of Murdoch et al. gives uh, the best results and uh, LRP is slightly better than CD. Both methods are based on decomposition principles. Um, but, the, but, the f but the full uh, LRP um, method, which was pro uh, suggested by, by Aras et al., I will also briefly talk about this later in my slides, uh, gave uh, better ex approaches, uh, better, exper better results than the other LRP variant, which was uh, used in Dink et al. Um, yes, and also here you see clearly that uh, LRP is not just gradient times input because gradient times input doesn't work really well on this uh, LSTM uh, explanation task. So uh, this is maybe also like a, to highlight here. And the good news is that just today we published a Keras toolbox containing different LRP, uh, different explanation techniques, including LRP. So this toolbox is very efficient. It, uh, it is highly efficient. It can f provide explanations like in milliseconds range um, uh, for complex models. And it implements like different techniques, different LRP variants, but also like more classical methods like gradient or deconvolution or guided backprop and so on. And uh, here are just like some, some, some uh, qualitative examples for the different methods. We didn't, we didn't perform yet a quantitative comparison. But even in this uh, qualitative examples, you see, for example, that for the, for, for the, for the last image where there is a crap uh, and, and like, like LRP, the, the two right LRP rules are very focusing on, on, on this crap, whereas some other methods are more assigned relevance all over the image and are less uh, selective. Good, so I think now we will have uh, 30 minutes. Of, uh, are, are there any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, just, uh, I'm not sure if I missed, uh, I have uh, like two questions. Yes. Uh, so the first, um, so once you decide on the pixel locations that are relevant to your, um, that will contribute most to changing your classifier score, uh, I di didn't really get exactly how would you corrupt them to actually do this measurement. So do you flip the pixel values, for example, or because depending on the magnitude and so on. And the other question is uh, related to applying this somehow to adversarial attacks and using a metric of, for instance, um, fooling rate. Um, and by measuring how much you have corrupted the energy of the noise and uh, compared to the fooling rate. So, so you, your first question was regarding like the expla ex not the explanation technique itself, but the evaluation of the explanation technique. Be because I'm, LRP doesn't like identify the pixels which are more sensitive, uh, but our ex evaluation technique for explanation techniques. Uh, so we, we first we sort. I mean, we, we sort the pixels according to relevance. So, so you get uh, like this heat map and what, what we do is we sort. So either we sort individual pixels or for example, we can also s do this uh, flipping on, on patches, on small patches. Uh, in this experiment, I think we even use like nine times, nine time cross nine uh, patches. And uh, then you identify the locations which are most important and you iteratively flip them or destroy information at that place. And you, there are many options how to do this. So you can, what we did is we, we sampled from the uniform distribution, for example, because this is like, you don't have any like additional assumptions if you do this, but you could also like do other d 
techniques to dis destroy information at that. Uh, but 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 what we didn't what, what we didn't do is we didn't we didn't like it, in adversarial attacks you try to uh, on purpose like change the image in a way so that the score like decreases uh, fastest or like flips from one class to another class. This is what I mean by non-specific. So we we didn't like want to design. Like a, like a flipping technique, which is like very specific for different locations and different for different locations. But we said, okay, at this, we just destroy information using random sampling or uniform sampling. So there is no, no bias in the evaluation in this way. Right. And the second question is uh, regarding adversarial attacks. Uh, yes, I mean, we, we also thought about it if, if we, you can identify uh, adversarial attacks using explanation methods. And it seems not so easy. I mean, so what in our initial experiments, we, uh, it, it was not that uh, the network, like with the original image, like focuses on this part, and if it's like full, then it focuses on another part. So uh, I think there is still more, ne more research needed for, for that to, to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very nice talk. Um, uh, you, you mainly talked about basically, I mean, you use different methods, explanation method to, to basically generate different heat maps. And you can, I mean, look at that heat map, look at that uh, basically, I mean, the ranking of the keywords by deleting the information and see how different explanation method works, right? Actually, I'm kind of very curious, can we kind of flip the question? If I, comp I try to compare different models, for example, VGG versus Inception Net, I can, I can look at the heat map. Do you, do you have any thoughts on how I can utilize this heat map to actually help me judge which model is better? Yeah, yeah. This, this, this will be a part of my second, of the second, oh, after okay. the break, I will, I will briefly mention also like this, because we also did this comparisons, yes. Okay, great. Maybe, maybe also my question is premature because you might cover it later. So can, can this be applied to improve a network maybe by, measuring and maybe inducing dropout, let's say, to improve network either by efficiency or performance, something like that. I mean. Yes, I mean, I, I will, we did some work along these lines, and I, I, will t I will present some examples like in the second part of my talk, but there is still, I think, put a lot of potential in this direction. So there is still a lot of work to do uh, to figure out like how can we in integrate this knowledge like in the best way to to make to improve your model. So we did some some work along these lines, but there is definitely other other options for yeah, future work. Yeah, maybe like to identify which nodes are are contributing the most, and maybe highlighting those so that the model will get more efficient. Yes, I mean there are different ways of how how you could do this. So you can you can change your data, or you could you could change your model, or you could uh, change your training parameters according to the explanations. There are, there are many ways I think to to do. And uh, I will present uh, later so, some, some initial experiments which we did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will have like 